Welcome to RA Online and uh, this module we will be dealing with hyperglycemic emergencies. I think this is a very, very practically important topic that all of us as practicing physicians uh, would uh, always like to know about. So in this particular module, we will be dealing with diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. Now when we talk about hyperglycemic emergencies, um, it is generally a combination of all the things that you are seeing on the screen right now. So it can mean hyperglycemia per se, which can also be associated with ketosis and acidosis. So the typical presentation of a hyperglycemic emergency can lie anywhere along the spectrum. One can have diabetic ketoacidosis, one can have a hyperosmolar state, or one may be dealing with a state in which the lactic acidosis also prevails. So it is something like a combination of all these factors that actually play in when you talk about hyperglycemic emergencies. So to start with, we will be dealing with DKA in more detail. Now diabetic ketoacidosis, as we all know, is severe uncontrolled diabetes requiring emergency treatment with insulin and intravenous fluids and with a total blood ketone body concentration of more than 5 millimoles per liter. So, as far as the numbers are concerned, we understand that the plasma glucoses have to be more than 250 milligrams, ketones of more than 2 millimoles and a blood pH of less than 7.1, which is also usually associated with respiratory rate of more than 36 per minute. And of course, we will have to exclude alcoholic ketoacidosis, drug-induced ketoacidosis, so on and so forth before we actually make a diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what could be the precipitating factors for DKA? Like we all know, ultimately it is the balance between insulin and the other counter hormones. So whenever there is relative insulin deficiency and counter hormone excess, you can expect diabetic ketoacidosis to picture in. So this can also be precipitated by certain conditions like fasting and dehydration. So all of them drive the patient on into the final common pathway resulting in DKA. So the bihormonal hypothesis in the pathogenesis of diabetic ketoacidosis largely lies with relative insulin deficiency, which could be because of insulin withdrawal. Say the patient has not taken insulin on a particular day. For whatever reason, they could have forgotten, especially if it's a type 1 beta cell failure, progressive beta cell failure, which can happen in our type 2 diabetics. Insulin resistance for whatever reason, say it could be an acute infection or, uh, you know, acute uh, medical comorbidity that the patient might be having. So all these conditions are where the insulin resistance really goes up and it could be stress hormone excess because of, you know, fasting or proper stress, be it physical or psychological stress, dehydration, all this play a very important role on to, you know, the pathogenesis of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what is the role of dehydration in DKA? I think dehydration is a very, very important, uh, you know, pathogenic process that drives diabetic ketoacidosis and drives the rest of the complications that happens in our patients with DKA. So for this, we need to understand that on one end, you have osmotic diuresis that happens due to glycosuria. And on the other hand, the patient also develops a lot of vomiting and diarrhea, which could mean usually vomiting because of the ketones which are present. And diarrhea can be supervening because of hypermotility of the gut, which could also happen. And all, along with all this, the patient might be septic, patient might have had an infection, patient might be hyperventilating. Now, all this will really push the picture into gross dehydration. And that is responsible for a poor tissue perfusion. And when that happens to all the vital organs, say the kidney, the liver and the peripheral muscles, everywhere this dehydration has a very, very important role to play. So as the dehydration kind of worsens, the patient might slip into prerenal acetemia, alterations in glucoses and ketone metabolism, and impaired substrate delivery and insulin delivery leading on to lactic acidosis. So what is important for us to understand is that during the first four hours of therapy, approximately 80% of glucose disappearance is due to renal excretion of glucose and peripheral disposal which is brought about by rehydration. Therefore, if we can prevent dehydration, severe hyperglycemia may not occur and also the concentration of all the stress hormones tend to decline when dehydration is taken care of. So, it is very, very important to bear in mind the pathogenesis 
of uh, DKA and the role of dehydration in its implications of DKA. Now, the presentation of diabetic ketoacidosis, now all of us are quite familiar with this. Patients might present with vomiting, thirst, polyuria, weight loss, pain, abdomen, weakness. In fact, it's a very, very, uh, what should I say, a famous undergraduate teaching where we say this is one of the medical causes for a patient to land in a surgical OP. So, pain abdomen can very well be diabetic ketoacidosis. So, always keep in mind that we need to look at the sugars, especially if the patient is a diabetic or if the patient is a child presenting with non-specific pain abdomen and vomiting. It is always worthwhile checking the sugars because it could really completely change the picture of what we are looking at. And as far as signs are concerned, we know that tachycardia could be there, hypotension, dehydration, Patient might initially be warm with dry skin, hyperventilating, hypothermia and as you allow this to progress, one may even slip into a state of impaired consciousness resulting in coma if left untreated. What are the clinical and biochemical correlates of diabetic ketoacidosis? Now, the biochemical abnormality, each one can have an implication as far as the clinical parameter is concerned. So, hyperglycemia, as we all know, can lead to polys, fatigue, muscle weakness, pruritus, blurring of vision, diminished mental alertness. All this can happen due to high sugars. Disordered protein metabol metabolism can cause a loss of muscle mass and weakness. Increase free fatty acids, glycerols, ketone. Now, all this is what is responsible for nausea, vomiting, pain abdomen, the acidotic breath or the acetone smell in breath that these patients bring out. All this is because of increased free fatty acids and ketones. And of course, metabolic acidosis, which really drives the patient into complications, that can lead on to hyperventilation and really rapid breathing, sometimes even necessitating ventilatory support. So, when you look at the initial lab values in a patient with DK, the glucose levels as we discussed are usually high, definitely more than 250 in most patients, even above 300 or even 400. Ketone bodies are strongly positive, bicarbs are low, less than 18. The pH is usually around 6.8 to 7.3. Now, the sodium and potassium can be variable when we are dealing with DK, by which I mean they can be low, they can be normal or they could even be high. Phosphate concentrations are usually normal or slightly low and the urea and creatinine because of the prerenal acetemia that I just discussed a little while ago can be mildly increased in patients with DKA. 